I'm going to start with, this is a really good article. It gives you some new ones too. And yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll get to them as I can. So what do attackers want? We'll start with that. Let's see. Yeah, so there's different attacks, reorg, there's double finality, finality delay. I don't want to go through each one because I know it's you know, probably going to be boring if I go through the technical details too, but this is a pretty good article. Let's see, what, what did I see that was pretty interesting from this? Attacking the protocol. This helped me like, kind of wrap my head around the different attacks too. Let's see, yeah, attacking the protocol. Anyone can run the client software to add a validated client. User required to do 32 Ether or 32 million pulse. Pause a contract. Validator now has a voice to influence contents. Yeah, so this is interesting. I think the the one thing I want to talk about here, and you can you can read more about this, but the cool thing is they explain the different what can happen. So attackers using greater than or 32, 33% of the total stake. So uh, all the attacks mentioned previously, the article has been more likely to see them as, as staked to vote. So 33% is they have the ability to prevent the chain from finalizing. So that's interesting. And then 50% is theoretically they split the chain in two, two equally sized forks, and then simply use the, the entire 50% to vote contrarily to the honest validator set. Inactivity leak on both forks eventually lead the chains to finalize. Yeah. And at that point, they'll fall back to shows for recovery. Interesting. And then attackers using greater than 66% of the total staked coins, whatever it is, Ether or PLS, can finalize their preferred chain without having to coerce any honest validators. So yeah, you definitely want to avoid this. You want to avoid 50%, you want to avoid 33% of centralization, but you really want to avoid 66% because uh, that looks like what we think of at the 51% attack, but this is kind of like, okay, 66%, they kind of control the chain, right? By purchasing Ether to control 60% rather than 51%, the attackers effectively bind the ability to do post reorg. So a lot of stuff, again, it's a lot of controls in place to make this not worth it. If you buy that much and you have that much, why, why are you going to destroy the value by causing disruption in the network, right? So it's kind of this check and balance on that too. Yeah, so anyways, this is interesting. Kind of helps you learn about blockchain stuff. I'm not going to talk about blockchain stuff very much today, but I thought that was worth bringing up. So that's in the chat if you guys want to look at it. Go to the chat real quick and say hi before we go into the best practices. Very good article. What's up, Bruno? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Good to see you. Glad you could join us, learn some stuff. Deep stakes, what's happening, man? I know, I know. It is exciting times. Exciting times indeed. All right, so this is one of the best articles I've found that comes across the security side of Validator. And again, this applies, a lot of it applies to Ubuntu. And I mean, that's what a lot of my scripts and stuff are based on too. So this is one of the things that a, so this is, so if you do AWS, this happens automatically. When you spin up an instance on AWS, you get a user named Ubuntu and it has pseudo privileges, passwordless pseudo privileges, which is effectively like your admin, your root. So you can become root anytime you want. You don't want to do things as root because one, it's dangerous. You may do something because you have, it's like you're, you have full control over the system and you don't want to be typing commands in that you may not understand the, the full effects of. You may typo something, which could be really bad. Do that as root, things get deleted, system could crash, all this stuff. That's why the whole concept of not being root, not being an administrator happens. And only you need to become it to you use sudo to become that and run commands as that, as needed. So you can run regular commands as a regular user, do a typo, it only affects your user account or you know, stuff you own. You mess up as root could affect the entire system. That's why that's that's why there's different users, not just you know. That's why there's separation of privileges between users and admin users and root. 
So think of the Ubuntu user that's default on AWS, for example. If a user has sudo privileges, they could have a password, which requires them to type one in in order to execute commands as root, or it could be passwordless, which means they just they can put sudo, and let's see if I have, yeah, I still have a terminal here. They can do, oh, did I reset? Let's see. Let's see if it's still, oh, cool, it's still there. So they would do like sudo ls, and this is gonna give me an error because it's not, it's not a real machine. They do ls or they do sudo ls. So this means run as root. This means run as current user. If you have access to root. So the first thing they talk about here is is not doing things as root. Basically, use a non-root user. So in this in this in our script, I go even beyond that, which they may talk about on this as well, and I create a whole different user that has no admin privileges to run the programs as to run the clients as. And that is the node user. And the node user, you can change it anything you want. Just change this to my life is awesome if you want. <laughs> change it to lit. Go go for it. Uh, but I just use node because it's generic, makes sense. And when it creates a user, it doesn't give it a shell by default. And it's uh it's a user with that doesn't have admin privileges. So it can't run sudo command. So that means if someone hacks your client and they get node privileges, they don't have root privileges, which is one more layer of uh, preventing them from getting full access and control of your server. They still have access to everything Node does, which is a lot of your stuff. I mean, it's running your clients, so it has access to your validator keys, probably and all that stuff too, but they can't get access to, uh, they can't fully control the server. Say that. So that is one thing we do. So I recommend that. Uh, creating a separate user to run everything as. Again, if you run the script, it does automatically. And then disable password authentication. So if you use AWS again, this is automatically done. There is no, I guess you could set it up to use a password, but by default, it uses SSH keys only. Now you can put a password on your SSH key, which is more secure, of course. Uh, think of your SSH key as your key equals, like your seed worth equals your money. Think of your key as your password but it's something you own, not something you type in. So you literally need to leak the file and you can't just type the file in anywhere. You probably wouldn't do that. You can, but it's much less likely than you would leak a password or reuse it. There's no password reuse. It just removes a lot of the attacks from passwords. So keys are much more secure than password auth. Even if you use a really good password, you can use a key and password auth if you want. It's obviously more secure because then you provide the key, something you have, in addition to something you know, the password. But by default, AWS just does keys only without key plus password, no password auth, keys only, but not by default, key plus password. SSH key is, is fine for basic stuff. You can read more about that here. So that's your remote authentication. That's the only services you, you should be having open is your remote access, which you can on AWS, you can narrow down to specific IP ranges. So you can say, I don't want everyone in the world to access this. I only want people coming from my particular ISP because my IP maybe changes some sometimes or my particular IP address. But if it changes, you get updated. update it. You can lock it down so people can't even access it unless they're coming from your computer. So there's another more stuff you can do uh, for that. Only SSH, if you're doing this from the cloud, for example, because you need to remotely access it for management. And your clients you get to open up with port 30303 and I forget the uh, Lighthouse one, like 9100, 9200, something like that. Those are the only ones you should have open on your, on your system. And then up to date. So this is something I have a script for as well. So when I set up a new AWS instance, I set up a new server, you know, I use this script or uh, a lot of times it just sets your host name. It tells the uh, login thing to be quieter and it does all your updates and it reboots for you. So I do that when I spin up a new server, I do, I run the script or do the, do it manually first to make sure I'm good to go. I get a good starting ground. I don't need to update later. You know, I set my host name. It can be anything you want, all that stuff. And your firewall. So this is your local firewall. So you have a global firewall, your network firewall, and that is something it's called security groups on AWS. Uh, it could be your router at home. Uh, let's see. 
I think I have a section on this on the readme. Let's do security. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. I'll add this in there afterwards. So yeah, so 9,000, that's the lighthouse port. And these are Geth and uh, Aragon, I believe they use the same ones. And this is for lighthouse. And let's see. Yeah, so these are security groups on AWS. So 22, uh, 12. And then, oh, there's also like 13,000, 12,000, I believe. Let's see what I set in. Let me duplicate and see if I can go to my script. Let's see what I set in my script. In my script, I set 9,000. Okay, maybe you don't necessarily need 12,000. 12, maybe that's like additional. I can't remember, but uh, you basically just need to open the ports for remote management and your clients. And again, you can do that from anywhere on the internet or specific to your IP range. I'll get to questions in just a minute. I'm going to get through a little bit more of this one. So fail to ban, I don't know. I, it's kind of like one of those things. It's not, it's, it's okay. It's just the only, if it's good, if you have a lot of different services running, if you have like SSH and you have, I don't know, FTP and I don't, if you have a whole bunch of different services running, it's more helpful. But if you just, if people are brute forcing your SSH and you're using key auth instead of password auth, they're never going to get in. They're never going to guess your key. Uh, like that's like, it comes down to math at that point. I'm pretty confident. You don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So it's nice to have, but honestly, if you're not running a whole bunch of other services, database services and otherwise, you probably shouldn't be running publicly in the first place. Then I don't know what kind of ROI. It's definitely nice to have, like it's not going to hurt anything, but it just basically auto blocks stuff when they see, it looks at log files, see if there's weird patterns, people trying to do stuff and it blocks them. But I don't know. It's to me, it's very optional. Disable root account. Eh. I mean, you don't. They're kind of disabled anyways. In a way, you can't really log in as root default anymore on Ubuntu. So, I don't worry too much about that. I'll just try to make sure I don't run the clients as admin user. That's more useful as I talked about previously. Two-factor auth also pretty cool. You can use a uh, the lib libpan Google Authenticator. And you can set up two-factor auth for a login. That's pretty cool. So if you want to be the most secure possible, SSH key with a password and two-factor auth with Google Authenticator. But I, yeah, that's you're going you're going pretty far. Like at, again, at the end of the day, it's not like if, if somebody could hack your validator and then steal your keys. Like if it was like one for one like that, it'd be different. You like really need to hold the hold down the fort. But the worst they can do is they get you slashed, but then get, I guess at home there's different risks. Again, they get on your network and start hacking your other computers and stuff like that. But if you're in the cloud, that's one thing you don't have to worry about. They can only access more stuff on your cloud. Sure, they could they could put a key logger on your validator server and hope you type in something sensitive that allows them somehow to get to your own network, but it's a stretch, we'll say that. Shared memory. I, I mean, I think that's optional too. It's not a lot of very situation specific. If you have stuff that that works better for, it's good, but it's kind of, I say low ROI for most people. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. So this is what I talked about earlier. Use a count. That's at least privilege. And this goes back to computer security fundamentals, privilege of least, what's it called? Privilege of least principle, uh, privilege, principle of least privilege. There you go. You only want to give it what it needs to run and nothing more. Uh, again, I, I could give you a uh, graduate course in security stuff, but it's a lot of the stuff is uh, just stick to the basics. All right. So we got through that. That's a good start. A lot of the good basics. Check that out and I will get to questions here. CMA says, yep, and then hijacks your session. They still need to know pseudo password doing damage. Yeah, hijacks your session. There's a lot of nuance in that one too, but yeah, that's, you definitely don't want it, you don't want them to be on your local network at all. And your uh, pseudo password is, should be protected, exactly. 
Mike says, I know David Feeder's offering consulting service to help manage validators. Would you consider offering a similar service? Mike, I do not monetize. I do not sell my time. I try to get away from that. I, you know, I want more freedom, not less. If I have clients, then I have less freedom, uh, logically. So nothing against people who do it. More power to you. I don't monetize. I don't sell my services, at least currently. That's my that's my style. That's my principles. Um, yeah, and that's why. So happy to, you know, I try to do the, these AMAs. This is kind of like my my patronage to the community. Uh, try to try to do AMAs, you know, answer DMs from time to time. But I don't see myself uh, getting, I've had people, what, maybe more than one people, actually, yeah, definitely more than people. I've had a few people offer to pay me and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, it, it's just, I don't want to, I don't want to sell my time. I've been selling my time for a long time and uh, I just don't want to sell it. I can give it to you uh, for free, a certain amount of it, but I can't, don't, uh, don't want to sell my time. So appreciate it though. Well, luckily, there's plenty of other people in the community doing that. Yeah, David, I think Gamma's got one-on-one. So they're holding down that fort. <laughs> hey, Simba, welcome. Mainnet is so close, isn't it? So close. Have there been any bugs found recently? If you're talking about in testnet, I think this the what they're doing some beacon, the beacon chain stuff. Some of the stuff's not enabled. I don't know if there's any bugs in particular. But if you go to Pulse Dev, uh, there's some conversation around some some of the beacon stuff. Maybe I know I was getting. It might have just been on my side, but I was uh, having problems looking at something earlier this morning on the validator side. But nothing critical. I don't think anything anything big. So. Do not disable root. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance to that, but in general, I just don't feel like it's worth it. I sell my time and stuff all the time. Yep. You can choose to do that. I mean, we all do it in a certain way. So I just, I just avoid doing it. We'll say that we all do it in a certain way, but uh, yeah, I avoid doing it. Take screenshots, list fairs. Yeah. That's if you have. That's what these AMAs are for. This is number nine. That means I've done eight before this, as well as a lot of other conversations uh, and stuff too. So um, check out the other AMAs. I guess I probably have ten or fifteen hours of content going through a lot of these different questions and setup and stuff. And or again, if you have specific questions, uh, feel free to ask. Validator curious. I like that. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to learn about Linux, you want to learn about security, learn about validators, it's a stream for you, sir. Yeah, no worries, folks. Yeah, I'll tell. Is it really 70 PLS a day for one validator? I have no idea. I don't know where you got that number. I'm not saying it's not correct, but I, if you ask me how much per PLS per day for a validator, I could not tell you. The API goes up and down. Testnet's going to be different than mainnet. I don't have a concrete numbers on that. So maybe I will one day or maybe somebody else will and I'll start quoting them. But yeah, I don't know. Remy, can you walk through exiting validator and then what's wrong? Yeah, you know what? Before I go into the next security, I did publish withdrawal instructions recently. So I will pulse um, the next security section and go through that real quick. I'll just share the link mostly because this is preliminary stuff. So put it in there because I just want to make sure people have information. I, I, you know, I didn't want to just like hold it cause it's not, it's not complete. That's why I didn't want to share it. So, you know, like I'm still, I'm still working through these processes and trying to synthesize it for you and, and go through the steps and stuff, but I'm very close. I got, it's mostly complete. Uh, but again, do not be extra careful. This is the time to test stuff on test net. Do not use these instructions for mainnet because testing is not completed. Use your own use. Hold yourself fully accountable for control of actions with your own funds, just like all other parts of crypto, okay? There are full withdrawals and partial withdrawals. So we're going to focus on full withdrawal. And then here's the different stuff. I'm not going to go through all of it and read it, but if you didn't set a withdrawal address, because I know a lot of people didn't, I didn't for, for my validators. So I was going through that process. The launch pad, it's not available to do all the steps. So there's like three steps. You need to, if you didn't set a withdrawal address, you need to upgrade your keys. Just think about it like that. And then use the staking deposit client to broadcast it uh, or using the staking deposit client 
and then broadcast it with the launch pad. But I asked Gamma, I was like, hey, I see all these tutorials. You just go to beaconchain.in and you do it. But where is Eric equivalent equivalent? He's like, ah, launch pad it. Devs haven't put on launch pad yet. So not critical. This is kind of a corner case, you know, on you know, it's test net on mainnet, you know, you should set up a draw address. But um, anyway, it's not available yet. I'm sure it will be. And then, then you can exit. So you update your keys, you broadcast it. Here are my updated keys. And then you exit your validator. So again, this is not available right now, as far as I know, could be any day. But the other two parts are, so again, uh, when, you're, when you're generating your withdrawal keys, do it on a different machine, treat it like your seed words, all that stuff, just like you would on your when you're originally doing this stuff. And here are the steps of how to do it. You clone it, you go through the process. Again, here's all the stuff. Read that. It'll tell you, I, you know, this is confirm. You have access to the wallet. Be very, very careful. You could lose all your funds. Seriously, be extremely careful that whatever wallet you set as your withdrawal address that you will and always have access to that. If you don't, there's no recovery method. This is be your own bank. So hold yourself accountable and do the right thing and get this get this correct. It's, it's a and your, your withdrawal address is your money. Your seed words are your money. So treat your money, uh, keep your money safe. And then, so that's the upgrade keys process. And then again, when I have, when the launch pad is available, I'll put the broadcast to launch pad process here and the exit process. So if, with Lighthouse, you run these commands, validator exit, and you set it to the public key of the validator that you want to exit. You could have more than one validator, but you set it to the one you want to exit, to that key store, to that JSON. You enter the password, key store password, just like you generated before with the validators. And then you enter the exit phrase, which is at this link. So you go to that link, go to the exit phrase. It'll tell you, just make sure you read the docs. And then it'll say, you know, says validated, publish a voluntary exit. And then you got to wait so long for it to do that. So that is the process. And then you'll see on the Beacon Explorer going from active to exit and like pulsing green uh, until it exits. And here are all the docs that I used in the video that I used to figure all this stuff out. Max is good at research, isn't he? That is kind of my, you know, we talk about superpowers and stuff, not having an emotional response to everything, staying calm, not getting angry, you know, not losing your peace, doing research. I gotta, I gotta say my professional life has made me above average doing research and synthesizing information, putting it together, understanding the nuance and then generating and sharing with you all. So I'm uh, happy, happy to have that skill. I can be, have utility with here. All right, back to security. So before I go to the next link, I will say hi. Believe in yourself that once you begin trading time dollars, yeah, slippery slope. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, was a quote the other day. Don't get addicted to monthly salary. Get addicted to monthly salary. You uh, may not be looking for any other way to live. I'll say that. So whenever that, um, let's look at the backups real quick. And then I will, yeah. Get outside. Um, how long have we been going? 42. Yeah, I'll go for about an hour. So now I'll talk for another 15 minutes or so, cover a bunch of stuff, and then uh, post your questions now because we're I'm going to go for about an hour today. So let's talk about backups, and then I'll get into the other stuff. So I've been trying to add all this stuff on the wiki. Backups. Yeah, I went over this a little bit earlier. Or no, I went over yesterday. Whenever yesterday. So on Linux, if you're doing a home server, basically you want to use rsync. And yeah, I didn't write any guidance on this because I'm, I'm I'm not my stuff isn't tailored to home servers, but not too hard to figure out. You know, use rsync to do backups. There's probably scripts out there you can use on GitHub. Otherwise, so just check that out. Here's the the best links I found for that. 
On the cloud, you can do snapshots. So snapshots will allow you to spin up another instance. So take a point in time of what you what your server looks like. So you get your server all synced. I'm pretty sure this is what the devs do. That I remember Richard and stuff talking about snapshots and EBS volumes and all this stuff. So imagine you have a bunch of validator servers, not validators, but validator servers. You have four or five different servers that you want to run a bunch of validators on, so like the dev team, for example, or you can just be yourself. And you set them up in each one, then you take a snapshot of that hard drive. Or you just set up one and then you create a bunch of other servers and you say, use this snapshot of the previous server's hard drive because it's got the blockchain synced. It's got everything set up on it already. All I got to do is import the keys and get it activated and we're good to go. So the few different ways you can use snapshots. One is for backups. So regularly on AWS, and there's all the instructions how to do all this stuff. You can take snapshots to say, okay, if your validator does get hacked or something, you can roll it back to beforehand, and assuming they don't keep exploiting the same security hole and you change your passwords or whatever it is, figure out how they got in. Assuming you fix that, you can roll back and now, hey, they're not on there anymore. It's like it never happened as far as locally on that server. So you can use it for a backup. You can use snapshots as a way to easily spin up new instances or use Terraform, infrastructure as code type of thing, which I believe the Pulse Chain devs are doing because I've heard rumblings of that in the last few months as well, to set one up, take a snapshot, and then say, spin me up 20 more servers and use this snapshot as that base OS, as that sync blockchain. So I can quickly get spun up, you know, import what I need to do, and I don't have to go through the same process manually each time. So you can use a snapshot for DevOps type stuff too. So snapshots are pretty cool. That's one advantage using the cloud. You don't have to like set up your own rsync and cron tab stuff. Uh, totally fine. You can totally do that. You can install commercial software. You can do whatever you want. But in the cloud, everything's virtual. And there's advantages to that, such as using the snapshot service AWS provides and all the cloud providers uh, as well, I'm sure. So that is backups. So check that out. And then I recommend everyone watch this video. Oops, let me put it up here. So this is a great video by Crypto Manufacturer, nice. And it really gives you a good baseline. I learned a lot from myself about validator security. It's, you know, it's like two years old, but I mean, it's super still relevant. It's about ETH 2.0, a lot of it's st still the same. So that's really cool. And so I definitely recommend checking this out. I dropped the link in the chat. And I want to cover DDoS protection. So I know if you're running websites and stuff, you can use Cloudflare and stuff. I've talked to Gamma about this. Uh, if you're exposing RPC services, uh, maybe you can use different DDoS protections. But if you're running a validator, I can, I just think that I don't know of any specific services to prevent that, but also I don't know how big of a risk it is either because People forget, people are like, oh, it's not just like you just click a button. Some person just clicks a button and it takes the server down. There's no cost to them. They need to expend resources to do that. So why would they target your validator in particular? Maybe they don't. Maybe they target other ones. Maybe they, you know, I need to see more case studies where people use DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks, DOS it's like a specific instance. DDoS is like a distributed DOS, which means multiple servers are attacking one. DOS just means like uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one deal. I need to see more case studies around why that's why there's ROI there for, for there to be protection. And the fact that commercial services like Cloudflare don't seem to be specifically supporting that don't sound like there's a big customer base either. So maybe it's not something you have to worry about as much. Uh, I'd love to hear opposing views and references for that, but I haven't, uh, I'm not sure DDoS protection is relevant for validators as my current understanding. So if that helps anyone who was wondering about it. Now, what can happen? Let's see, I'll put it here. I got the security section. So one of the biggest questions that I was wondering about is what can happen? What is the worst that can happen if your validator gets hacked? I kind of over already touched on this. 
as far as I know, the worst that can happen if your validator gets hacked, your your validator keys are stolen because they're probably on there and all that stuff, or either like, you know, because your validator is using them. So they're, they're in there one way or another. Or they just have control of your server so they can influence the clients in other ways too. It doesn't really have to exactly steal the keys, but they have control of, over what you're doing on the validator. Worst that can happen is you lose some pulse or ETH, whatever network you're running, and you have a forced exit. You're like you're so bad, you get slashed that you're just gone. They can pretend to be it. They can do other stuff like that. So not the end of the world. You don't want it to happen, but not the end of the world. You can do a backup, get back online, make sure they don't hack into it. You know, if, if you can figure out what happened, and then you're good. It's not like they're going to take your money. They're not going to take your deposit just by hacking your validator server. One doesn't equal one on that. It's not, not the, it's not the way to do it. However, if for some reason your seed words are on that validator. Yes. Then they can, if they get your seed words one way or another, whether it's on your validator, which you shouldn't be, it should be generated, you know, on a different device, all that stuff we talked about a million times, or they somehow, they hack your validator and then they somehow get on another computer on your network that has your seed words, which again, shouldn't be there. It should not be kept digitally. It should be on paper or metal. Just as if you're treating your wallet, your cold storage wallet for anything else. Kind of treat it in that way. Because your seed words equal your deposit. Think about it like that. Whoever has your seed words, you don't own anything on the blockchain. You have access to it. So even the words, even your money, it's not even your money. It's just you happen to generate, uh, you, had, you happen to come up with an address that on the blockchain, that, that values are set where it says there's, there's value there, there's money there, and you happen to have access to it. So if your seed words are the money, you should protect them in that way. So just getting a validator hacked doesn't mean they can steal your POS. They may get you slashed, they may get you penalized, but they can't steal it directly unless they get your seed words. Um, because your seed words allow you to do two things, recover your validator keys and initiate a withdrawal. So because the withdrawal key is derived from the you know, 24 monomic seaports. So again, this is why you should generate seaports offline, nowhere near your server, keep them, uh, keep them out of memory, keep them out of file system, keep them, you know, paper metal, secure spot, just as if they were your money. Does that make sense, everyone? So that was the biggest question for me that I, I didn't understand at first was like, what happens if reality gets hacked? And then did the research, watched the video, able to present that. So I asked ChatGPT, last thing I'll cover before we wrap up, I asked ChatGPT, what are some things to do to keep your server secure? Uh, give me, I said to give me like 12 things or something like that. Uh, it says, use a dedicated machine, run your validator on a separate dedicated machine and minimize tax service. Cool. Keep your software updated. That's, uh, that's good for everything. Have you ever seen a security AMA of mine? It's like simple security stuff. Keep your seed words safe one way or another and update your browser because most attacks these days happen from browsers, not your IP address, unless you're running a validator server. But most of the things when you're browsing the internet are browser attacks, email attacks, phishing attacks, run the CXC attacks. They're not targeting your browser's IP address. Uh, but if you're running a validator server, you know that then, then they would be targeting your IP address and the service is running on it. But again, we've already went through how to keep that stuff up to date. Keep your clients up to date in case there's any security bugs. Keep your operating system up, up to date because there's security bugs from time to time. Uh, ChatGPT says enable firewall. Yeah, we talked about that. Use strong, unique passwords or use keys. They're even better. Implement 2FA. We talked about 2FA as well. You can do that on SSH. Harden your operating system. Disable unnecessary services applications. Um, sure, but just use a clean operating system and don't install a bunch of stuff. That's a general way to have a good time. Employee network segmentation. So that's like a VPC type thing, but you're in the cloud. It could be a segregating your LAN. So again, if you want to, if you're running at a home, I would recommend you separate it from your home network. So basically you, you use two routers. So you have a router that all your stuff in your home network, your Wi-Fi, all this stuff goes on. And then for your validator ser server, you have another router that has access to the internet, but it is, is isolated from everything else. And you only plug in physically through ethernet, you plug your validator server into that router. 
again, away from your network, turn off Wi-Fi, don't need any of that. That's how I would do it. I would, I would have it on a separate network if I was running at home. And you can Google for how to do that stuff as well. Uh, and then monitor logs and alerts. Yeah, on AWS, they have some logs and stuff. But um, I mean, yeah, keep your, keep, keep your AWS keys safe. Keep your username and password safe. I guess that's one thing we didn't talk about. But anyone who can log into your, or you can disable console access, but that means you need to use, know how to use AWS CLI, which for, you know, for not, for non-advanced users, all the advanced users use CLI, a lot of them. I like the web, I like the web concept from time to time, but you know, it is, it is a, uh, yeah. Keep your password off and your, uh, turn on 2FA on your account. That's another good thing too. Uh, that's about it. Let me talk about backups. HSM is not super accessible for the commodity people. Limit physical access. Yeah. I mean, that's something. Make sure people can't literally physically come and stick a USB key in your server or steal your server and go work on it otherwise. Educate yourself. Cool. Yeah. Pretty good advice from ChatGPT on that too. All right. That's, I think that's all I got for you.